So yes, I'm Greg Holmes, and I'm one of the multiple PIs on this project with Han Van Barkel and Ethel and Wong Jabs. And as the title says, our project is the transcriptome atlases of the craniofacial sutures. And our goal for this project is to create RNA-seq transcriptional atlases of craniofacial sutures at the subregional and single cell level using a mouse as a model. So just having trouble advancing at the moment. Okay, there we go. So understanding, so sutures are fibrous joints that separate the bones of the vertebrate skull. So in the simplest definition, sutures consist of two subregions. One subregion is the osteogenic fronts, shown on our side here in blue. And this are, these are sites of bone growth as preosteoblasts proliferate and differentiate to osteoblasts to form the growing bone. The second subregion is the suture mesenchyme, and this separates the osteogenic fronts. During postnatal life, the suture mesenchyme becomes a niche for stem cells, allowing skull bone maintenance, as shown in recent years by Yang Chai's and other groups. However, the relationship between the suture mesenchyme and the osteogenic fronts during suture growth is still poorly defined. Now, understanding suture gene expression at the subregional and the single cell level is important because differential gene expression underlies normal suture development and normal craniofacial development. So the coronal suture provides a good example of this. So if you look at the drawing of the human embryonic skull in the center here, this red line shows the coronal suture between the frontal and the parietal bones. The dotted line indicates the plane of section of these two images on the left, and these show RNA expression in the mouse coronal suture at E16.E16. E16. In the top panel, FGF receptor 2 here is expressed in the osteogenic fronts of the parietal and the frontal bones. In the, in the bottom panel, twist 1, which regulates FGF receptor 2 expression, is expressed in both the suture mesenchyme and the osteogenic fronts. So on the right, you can see the results of mutations of these genes on the coronal suture development. Activating mutations of FGF receptor 2 cause the apert craniosynostosis syndrome in humans, with results shown on the top here. Normally, the coronal suture is open, as you can see on the left panel here of the normal embryonic human skull. But in apert syndrome, shown on the right, the coronal suture fuses, impairing skull growth. This phenotype is recreated in our mouse model of the disease. On the left, you can see the open coronal suture, and on the right, the suture is fused in the apert mouse. Similarly, twist one mutations, or twist one loss of function mutations, cause the Sethrotrotsin craniosynostosis syndrome in humans. Again, the coronal suture is open, and you can see that as a line in this audio radiograph on the left of a normal skull. But on the right, the suture is fused and absent in the radiograph of the Sethotrotsin patient. And again, these phenotypes are also recreated in a mouse model of the disease. So in the panel on the left, you see that again, the normal open coronal suture in a wild type mouse. And on the right panel, there's the fused coronal suture in the Sethotrotsin mouse. So mutations in about 80 genes have been found to cause craniosynostosis or other suture defects in humans. However, the genetic defect in the majority of human craniosynostosis cases, which are non-syndromic, is not known. Likewise, the full complement of suture gene expression is also not known. So cataloging such expression will greatly aid in understanding normal and pathologic suture development. So our aim for this project, as I said, is to create transcriptome atlases for 11 major craniofacial sutures. These are shown in these micro CT images of the mouse skull at E18.5. I should point out these images are of the actual ossified or mineralized bone. So the osteogenic fronts and suture mesenchyme would be at the, at the edges or between bones in these images. So as I said, we're doing 11 sutures. These are listed down on the left. And the sutures themselves vary in a number of ways that may result from or at least impact gene expression differences between them. This could be their location, whether they're cranial, could be in the top of the head or the skull, or facial, 
such as a lot of the palatal sutures. Their lineage, whether they're from neural crests or from mesoderm, or they could be a mixed lineage. There's the specific bone identity. So individual bones of a different anatomic order maybe have differential gene expressions. And there's also the bone structure. And this is whether the ends of the bones, the osteogenic fronts, meet end to end, and they could meet end to end narrowly, or they could meet end to end broadly, or they could be overlapping. For example, the frontal suture indicated here between the yellow frontal bones and the middle panel is derived from neural crest. Both the suture mesenchym and the bones are derived from neural crest. In contrast, in the coronal suture, again, staying with this middle panel, is between the neural crest derived frontal bone and the mesoderm derived parietal bone, and the mesenchym itself is derived from mesoderm. So, our approach is to perform laser capture microdissection of embryonic sutures, as shown for E18.5 in this slide. We isolate osteogenic fronts from the osteogenic sutures by laser capture microdissection to generate RNA-seq libraries. So here we show two examples with an alkaline phosphatase stain section of a suture at the top of each to show you the limits of the osteogenic fronts and the intervening suture mesenchym. In this case on the left, it's a frontal suture, and in this case on the right, it's a coronal suture. So below these, we have before and after images of laser capture microdissection. So the, for the frontal suture on the left, we generate two samples. The osteogenic fronts, in this case, are between homologous bones. And so we collect these as one sample. The suture mesenchyme in between is a second sample. So for the frontal suture, we generate two RNA-seq libraries. And therefore, in general, for all sutures that involve homologous bones, and with typical of the midline sutures, we generate two RNA-seq samples. So in contrast, for the coronal suture on the right, we generate three samples. The osteogenic fronts of the non-homologous frontal and parietal bones are collected as separate samples, and the suture mesenchym is a third sample. So three RNA-seq libraries are generated for this suture. And again, for all sutures involving non-homologous bones, we generate three RNA-seq libraries. So this just shows the workflow for the RNA-seq library generation. For each suture, we have five biological replicates. In almost all cases, these will be from a single embryo. Libraries are generated from between one to 10 nanograms of RNA. So this requires RNA amplification with RNA suppression. And then the libraries are typically sequenced on an Illumina HiSec 2500 platform with paired end sequencing of 100 nucleotide reads so that we can capture alternate splicing and with a sufficient read depth that we can get comprehensive ex gene expression detection. So this chart summarizes the total number of RNA-seq libraries for wild-type sutures. Each of the rows at the left is a suture, and we're doing two ages for most sutures, E16.5 and E18.5, during which some suture morphology can change dramatically. Each square represents the RNA-seq libraries generated from one suture. So it's divided in half for sutures with homologous bones, giving two RNA-seq libraries, as here for the frontal suture. Or it's divided in thirds for the non-homologous, or sutures with non-homologous bones, which will give us three RNA-seq libraries. The darker shades represent the osteogenic fronts, and the lighter shades represent the suture mesenchyme. As I said, there are five replicates for each age and each suture, and this will total 285 RNA-seq libraries. And this includes the E14.5 coronal suture, which we're including because this suture forms much earlier than other sutures. So this chart similarly summarizes the total number of RNA-seq libraries for the mutant FGF receptor 2 and twist one sutures. So for the, 
for the FGF receptor 2 APIP mutant, we're doing all the same sutures that we did for the wild type as sutures other than the coronal also be confusing or are otherwise affected during embryonic development in this period. We also include the two sutures affected in the twist one model during this time, the frontal suture, which is actually wider than the wild type sutures, and the coronal suture, which fuses by, because of perineal stenostosis during this time. And therefore, this will give us a total of 350 RNA-seq libraries. So currently, we have data sets for eight sutures deposited within phase space, represented here by heat maps derived by hierarchical clustering of differential gene expression across all the suture subregions, ages, and genotypes within each suture data set. The numbers here in brackets or parentheses indicate the number of RNA-seq libraries within each data set. And these comparisons that I'm showing you are more complex than a simple pairwise you know, frontal versus uh, osteogenic front versus suture mesenchyme comparison, because it's including all the conditions in the library. But you can see that there's clear differential expression between cross sub between samples in each data set. So overall, we see about 7,000 differentially expressed genes across amongst all of these data sets across suture subregions, ages, and genotypes. So in summary, to date we have 500 suture subregions that have been dissected from the 11 sutures to generate RNA-seq libraries, and nearly 400 uh, from the eight sutures that I just showed you are deposited in phase space. Another 100 RNA-seq libraries comprising the sagittal and the squamo parietal sutures are currently being synthesized and furthermore, RNA has been isolated from 45 of the 60 suture, 60 suture subregions that will make up the premaxillary maxillary sutures. This totals 543 RNA samples isolated and or converted to RNA-seq libraries. So bulk RNA-seq allows deep sequencing of the suture subregions, which provides a comprehensive assessment of suture gene expression including detection of rare transcripts and alternative splicing. However, the process homogenizes any cell type variation that may exist within these subregions. But identifying these cell types is important because for understanding such processes such as the progressive osteoblast differentiation within sutures during development. The single cell sequence, sorry. Single cell sequencing allows identification of these subpopulations. The disadvantage of single cell sequencing is that sequencing depth is much shallower, so a lot of transcripts are missed, and therefore cellular processes of potential interest may go unnoticed. Detection of alternate splicing is also limited or not possible. So bulk and single cell sequencing are both valuable and complementary approaches to understanding suture biology and we've been funded with a competitive revision of the original grant in order to carry out single cell analysis of select calvarial sutures. So we're working on four wild type sutures at three ages that both complement and extend the transcriptome atlas data. The four sutures are the calvarial sutures most commonly affected in human craniosynostosis, the coronal, the lambdoid, the frontal, and the sagittal. The three ages reflect distinct phases of suture formation and function, and are represented here by images of the sagittal suture on the right. So these ages are E18.5, which captures embryonic skull growth and early suture formation, and provides a useful comparison with our E18.5 bulk atlas data. P10 captures postnatal growth and such events as posterior frontal suture fusion and development of the stem cell niches. And P28 captures the more st stable skull and suture maintenance. So to perform single cell sequencing, we're using the chromium system from 10X Genomics, which is a droplet-based method. Individual sutures, the frontal, coronal, digital, and lambdoid are dissected, and single cell suspensions are made by protease digestion. 
The chromium system then combines single cells with oligocoated beads and reaction solution in droplets capsulated in oil. And you're are, at five with, minutes. Sorry? You're at five minutes. Within which barcoded, I didn't realize it was that quick, after which, which are within which the barcoded cell libraries are created, after which all cell libraries can be combined for sequencing. So, so far, six sutures have been profiled with all cell counts and reads listed on the right. The 18.5 sagittal is being prepared for submission, completing the 18.5 data set, and the remaining P10 and P28 sutures will be completed during the no-cost extension period in the next few months. The clustering of cell types in the coronal and lambdoid E18.5 and P10 sutures data, or data sets are represented here by TISNY plots. You can see cells that we can identify as osteoblasts in red or suture mesenchym in ochre. And further analysis of these clusters reveals subclusters of cell types within them. You can also see in the 18.5 data sets that we capture other cell types beyond suture mesenchym and osteoblasts that aren't normally considered in studies of the suture, but are still biologically relevant, such as capillary endothelial cells, parasites, and macrophages. And then when we look at P10 sutures, you can see an even more complicated mix of cell types within the sutures, largely with the addition of more macrophage subtypes, immune cells, such as B and T cells, and osteoclasts. So for those who would be interested in using this data, we'd now like to show some use case examples. The first example is of differential gene expression, where one would ask what genes are differentially expressed between suture mesenchyme and osteogenic front subregions, or how does this gene expression change within a subregion during development, and what gene ontology terms may be enriched for a given suture. In which case, from our data sets, hierarchical clustering would first be performed, and then expression and ontology interrogated. So, so taking the frontal suture as our suture of interest, one would go to the FaceSpace homepage, click on the Projects tab, and access the Transcriptome Atlas project at the link here shown at the top, where you can choose from our list of data sets, the frontal suture data set, available expanded here in the bottom. This takes you to the list of our wild type subregion data sets for each age. 16.5 and E18.5, indicated here, and from which you can then click and download the relevant data sets. In this instance, showing the 18.5 frontal suture, and there's two FASTQ files for each suture, one for each of the paired end reads for each replicate. The hierarchical clustering of the wild type frontal sutures, shown here, from the frontal suture of the wild type frontal libraries generates this heat map showing almost 1300 genes differentially expressed between the osteogenic fronts and the suture mesenchyme. The clustering clearly separates these two subregions with the osteogenic fronts on the left and the mesenchyme on the right. Furthermore, you can see that the individual ages within each subregion, so here the E16.5 and the 18.5 osteogenic fronts, are separated. Similarly with the mesenchyme, which is very clear in this group of genes shown in this area, or this area, or this area. So on the upper right is an example of a browser track showing that the osteoblast gene integrin binding cellular protein is detected in osteogenic front samples, but not in suture mesenchyme samples. And then gene ontology analysis of the osteogenic front genes shows expected categories of ossification, but also of interest sterile related categories, which suggests a connection to hedgehog signaling, which requires cholesterol modification of the ligand, or perhaps is indicative of changes to the lipid content of the cell membrane in osteogenic fronts. In addition to looking at gene expression in subregions in this basic way, we can also use information from secondary gene co-expression and network analysis integrated with differential gene expression and single cell analyses to learn more about the context of a gene, such as, where, again, where it is expressed in the suture, how does its expression change during development, and what cell types is it expressed, what genes it is co-expressed with, 
and related ontology terms. So as before, from the bulk RNA sec data, we can see that using IPSP as an example, it's highly expressed in the osteogenic fronts at E16.5 and E18.5, with little change between these two ages. On the right is a Tisney plot of the single cell analysis of the wild type E18.5 frontal suture, where you can see that IBSP expression highlighted in red signal corresponds to, or its expression is highest in cells that we can identify as osteoblasts. Time. Okay. So co-expression network analysis of the bulk RNA-seq data places IBSP in here in a module that is submodule that is highly enriched for osteoblast-related genes, including such, such genes as SMPD3, SL13AC5, and CAR1, with which IBSP has direct connections. Um, and just briefly then, for the purposes of, of this talk, we present this example of an integrative secondary analysis that can be done with our data. To facilitate these kinds of analysis, we've aggregated co-expression network data in a matrix form, showing the log 10 FDR significance values of various data sets, including bulk RNA differential expression, single cell types, and gene ontology categories when intersected with the network modules. So, Using the IBSP network module, we can see that if you scan along the row, that the genes in this module are significantly expressed in the osteogenic front at both E16.5 and 18.5, but not the suture mesenchyme, and there's no differential expression at either age. Um, the genes are enriched in the osteoblast cells, but not in the suture mesenchyme subsets, sub cell subsets within the mesenchyme. And the developmental process is the gene ontology term associated with this module. So use cases like this could arise from these relevant face-based projects. Um, they could arise from human genomics analyses, which give rise to genes that are perhaps associated with craniofacial defects. They could arise from enhancer element studies, and again, Enhancers may be associated with genes of interest, or they could be specific genes affecting zebrafish craniofacial development. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and acknowledge the other members of the team. The KPIs are Ethel and Wang Jabs and Han Van Barkel. Wet lab members include Joshua Rivera, Na Lu, and Bhavana Shivale. And bioinformatics members include Anna Silvia Gonzalez, right, and Divya Kriti. Bin Zhang and Xian Zhao have helped with network analysis. Dalila Pinto has assisted with single cell analysis. Michael Donovan has granted access to the laser capture microscope used for this project. And Stephen Potter has provided a fantastic facility for the bulk RNA sec library analysis. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Um, so we can have questions now. Timothy, thank you. Uh, nice presentation, Greg. Is the tabulated data available online as well? Uh, so FaceSpace was funded for generating the data. Uh, for secondary analysis, we received an RO3, uh, which we're using to do the secondary analysis. Great. And then Trevor has a question. Greg, were there any take-home messages and differences in the sutures, for example, SHH or FGF signatures? Um, so for FGF receptor, or the FGF receptors, we haven't really seen significant striking differences. We definitely see differences between sutures in gene expression within genes that may sort of you know, prompt you to think of various you know, specialized mechanisms that may be going on in a suture in a particular location. One thing we also found, though, is that you may have gene expression at similar levels between sutures. But if you check with an antibody, you may see different levels of protein between sutures. So that's been very interesting. Um, 